Section 17 of The Extermination of the American Bison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. The Extermination of the American Bison by William T. Hornaday. Part 2, Chapter 2 methods of slaughter continued two the chase on horseback or running buffalo next to the still hunt the method called running buffalo was the most fatal to the race and the one most universally practiced to all hunters save greedy white men the chase on horseback yielded spoil sufficient for every need and it also furnished sport of a superior kind manly exhilarating and well spiced with danger even the horses shared the excitement and eagerness of their riders so long as the weapons of the indian consisted only of the bow and arrow and the spear he was obliged to kill at close quarters or not at all and even when firearms were first placed in his hands their caliber was so small the charge so light and the indian himself so poor a marksman at long range that his best course was still to gallop alongside the herd on his favorite buffalo horse and kill at the shortest possible range from all accounts the red river half-breeds who hunted almost exclusively with firearms never dreamed of the deadly still hunt but always killed their game by running it in former times even the white men of the plains did most of their buffalo hunting on horseback using the largest sized colt's revolver sometimes one in each hand until the repeating rifle made its appearance which in a great measure displaced the revolver in running buffalo but about that time began the mad warfare for robes and hides and the only fair and sportsmanlike method of hunting was declared too slow for the greedy buffalo skinners then came the cold-blooded butchery of the still hunt from that time on the buffalo as a game animal steadily lost caste it soon came to be universally considered that there was no sport in hunting buffalo true enough of still hunting where the hunter sneaks up and shoots them down one by one at such long range the report of his big rifle does not even frighten them away so far as sportsmanlike fairness is concerned that method was not one whit more elevated than killing game by poison but the chase on horseback was a different thing its successful prosecution demanded a good horse a bold rider a firm seat and perfect familiarity with weapons the excitement of it was intense the dangers not to be despised and above all the buffalo had a fair show for his life or partially so at least the mode of attack is easily described whenever the hunters discovered a herd of buffalo they usually got to leeward of it and quietly rode forward in a body or stretched out in a regular skirmish line behind the shelter of a knoll perhaps until they had approached the herd as closely as could be done without alarming it usually the unsuspecting animals with a confidence due more to their great numbers than anything else would allow a party of horsemen to approach within from two hundred to four hundred yards of their flankers and then they would start off on a slow trot the hunters then put spurs to their horses and dashed forward to overtake the herd as quickly as possible once up with it each hunter chooses the best animal within his reach chases him until his flying steed carries him close alongside and then the arrow or the bullet is sent into his vitals the fatal spot is from twelve to eighteen inches in circumference and lies immediately back of the foreleg with its lowest point on a line with the elbow this the true chase of the buffalo was not only exciting but dangerous it often happened that the hunter found himself surrounded by the flying herd and in a cloud of dust so that neither man nor horse could see the ground before them 
under such circumstances fatal accidents to both men and horses were numerous it was not an uncommon thing for half-breeds to shoot each other in the excitement of the chase and while now and then a wounded bull suddenly turned upon his pursuer and overthrew him the greatest number of casualties were from falls of the dangers involved in running buffalo colonel dodge writes as follows the danger is not so much from the buffalo which rarely makes an effort to injure his pursuer as from the fact that neither man nor horse can see the ground which may be rough and broken or perforated with prairie dog and gopher holes this danger is so imminent that a man who runs into a herd of buffalo may be said to take his life in his hand i have never known a man hurt by a buffalo in such a chase i have known of at least six killed and a very great many more or less injured some very severely by their horses falling with them on this point catlin declares that to engage in running buffalo is at the hazard of every bone in one's body to feel the fine and thrilling exhilaration of the chase for a moment and then as often to upbraid and blame himself for his folly and imprudence previous to my first experience in running buffalo i had entertained a mortal dread of ever being called upon to ride a chase across a prairie dog town the mouth of a prairie dog's burrow is amply large to receive the hoof of a horse and the angle at which the hole descends into the earth makes it just right for the leg of a running horse to plunge into up to the knee and bring down both horse and rider instantly the former with a broken leg to say the least of it if the rider sits loosely and promptly resigns his seat he will go flying forward as if thrown from a catapult for twenty feet or so perhaps to escape with a few broken bones and perhaps to have his neck broken or his skull fractured on the hard earth if he sticks tightly to his saddle his horse is almost certain to fall upon him and perhaps kill him judge then my feelings when the first bunch of buffalo we started headed straight across the largest prairie dog town i had ever seen up to that time and not only was the ground honeycombed with gaping round holes but it was also crossed here and there by treacherous ditch-like gullies cut straight down into the earth to an uncertain depth and so narrow as to be invisible until it was almost time to leap across them but at such a time with the game thundering along a few rods in advance the hunter thinks of little else except getting up to it he looks as far ahead as possible and helps his horse to avoid dangers but to a great extent the horse must guide himself the rider plies his spurs and looks eagerly forward almost feverish with excitement and eagerness but at the same time if he is wise he expects a fall and holds himself in readiness to take the ground with as little damage as he can mr catlin gives a most graphic description of a hunting accident which may fairly be quoted in full as a type of many such i must say that i fully sympathize with m chardon in his estimate of the hardness of the ground he fell upon for i have a painful recollection of a fall i had from which i arose with the settled conviction that the ground in montana is the hardest in the world it seemed more like falling upon cast iron than prairie turf i dashed along through the thundering mass as they swept away over the plain scarcely able to tell whether i was on a buffalo's back or my horse hit and hooked and jostled about till at length i found myself alongside my game when i gave him a shot as i passed him i saw guns flash about me in several directions but i heard them not amidst the trampling throng m chardon had wounded a stately bull and at this moment was passing him with his piece levelled for another shot they were both at full speed and i also within the reach of the muzzle of my gun when the bull instantly turned receiving the horse upon his horns and the ground received poor chardon who made a frog's leap of some twenty feet or more over the bull's back and almost under my horse's heels i wheeled my horse as soon as possible and rode back where lay poor chardon gasping to start his breath again 
and within a few paces of him his huge victim with his heels high in the air and the horse lying across him i dismounted instantly but chardon was raising himself on his hands with his eyes and mouth full of dirt and feeling for his gun which lay about thirty feet in advance of him heaven spare you are you hurt chardon hick 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 no hick no no i believe not oh this is not much monsieur cataline this is nothing new but this is a damned hard piece of ground here hick oh hick at this the poor fellow fainted but in a few moments arose picked up his gun took his horse by the bit which then opened its eyes and with a hick and a ugh ugh sprang upon its feet shook off the dirt and here we were all upon our legs again save the bull whose fate had been more sad than that of either the following passage from mr alexander ross's graphic description of a great hunt in which about four hundred hunters made an onslaught upon a herd affords a good illustration of the dangers in running buffalo on this occasion the surface was rocky and full of badger holes twenty-three horses and riders were at one moment all sprawling on the ground one horse gored by a bull was killed on the spot two more were disabled by the fall one rider broke his shoulder blade another burst his gun and lost three of his fingers by the accident and a third was struck on the knee by an exhausted ball these accidents will not be thought over numerous considering the result for in the evening no less than thirteen hundred and seventy-five tongues were brought into camp it really seems as if the horses of the plains entered wilfully and knowingly into the war on the doomed herds but for the willingness and even genuine eagerness with which the buffalo horses of both white men and indians entered into the chase hunting on horseback would have been attended with almost insurmountable difficulties and the results would have been much less fatal to the species according to all accounts the horses of the indians and half-breeds were far better trained than those of their white rivals no doubt owing to the fact that the use of the bow which required the free use of both hands was only possible when the horse took the right course of his own free will or else could be guided by the pressure of the knees if we may believe the historians of that period and there is not the slightest reason to doubt them the buffalo horses of the indians displayed almost as much intelligence and eagerness in the chase as did their human riders indeed in running buffalo with only the bow and arrow nothing but the willing cooperation of the horse could have possibly made this mode of hunting either satisfactory or successful in lewis and clark's travels volume two page three eighty seven appears the following record he sergeant pryor had found it almost impossible with two men to drive on the remaining horses for as soon as they discovered a herd of buffaloes the loose horses immediately set off in pursuit of them and surrounded the buffalo herd with almost as much skill as their riders could have done at last he was obliged to send one horseman forward and drive all the buffaloes from the route the hon h h sibley who once accompanied the red river half-breeds on their annual hunt relates the following one of the hunters fell from his saddle and was unable to overtake his horse which continued the chase as if he of himself could accomplish great things so much do these animals become imbued with a passion for this sport on another occasion a half-breed left his favorite steed at the camp to enable him to recruit his strength enjoining upon his wife the necessity of properly securing the animal which was not done not relishing the idea of being left behind he started after us and soon was alongside and thus he continued to keep pace with the hunters in the pursuit of the buffalo seeming to await with impatience the fall of some of them to the earth the chase ended he came neighing to his master whom he soon singled out although the men were dispersed here and there for a distance of miles colonel r i dodge in his plains of the great west page one twenty nine describes a meeting with two mexican buffalo hunters 
whose horses were so fleet and so well trained that whenever a herd of buffalo came in sight instead of shooting their game wherever they came up with it the one having the best horse would dash into the herd cut out a fat two-year-old and with the help of his partner then actually drive it to their camp before shooting it down they had a fine lot of meat and a goodly pile of skins and they said that every buffalo had been driven into camp and killed as the one i saw it saves a heap of trouble packing the meat to camp said one of them naively probably never before in the history of the world until civilized man came in contact with the buffalo did whole armies of men march out in true military style with officers flags chaplains and rules of war to make war on wild animals no wonder the buffalo has been exterminated so long as they existed north of the missouri in any considerable number the half-breeds and indians of the manitoba red river settlement used to gather each year in a great army and go with carts to the buffalo range on these great hunts which took place every year from about the fifteenth of june to the first of september vast numbers of buffalo were killed and the supply was finally exhausted as if heaven had decreed the extirpation of the species the half-breed hunters like their white robe-hunting rivals farther south always killed cows in preference to bulls so long as a choice was possible the very course best calculated to exterminate any species in the shortest possible time the army of half-breeds and indians which annually went forth from the red river settlement to make war on the buffalo was often far larger than the army with which cortez subdued a great empire as early as eighteen forty six it had become so great that it was necessary to divide it into two divisions one of which the white horse plain division was accustomed to go west by the assiniboine river to the rapids crossing place and from there in a southwesterly direction the red river division went south to pembina and did most of their hunting in dakota the two divisions sometimes met says professor hind but not intentionally in eighteen forty nine a mr flett took a census of the white horse plain division in dakota territory and found that it contained six hundred and three carts seven hundred half-breeds two hundred indians six hundred horses two hundred oxen four hundred dogs and one cat in his red river settlement mr alexander ross gives the following census of the number of carts assembled in camp for the buffalo hunt at five different periods number of carts assembled for the first trip in eighteen twenty five hundred and forty in eighteen twenty five six hundred and eighty in eighteen thirty eight hundred and twenty in eighteen thirty five nine hundred and seventy in eighteen forty one thousand two hundred and ten the expedition which was accompanied by rev mr belcourt a catholic priest whose account is set forth in the hon mr sibley's paper on the buffalo was a comparatively small one which started from pembina and very generously took pains not to spoil the prospects of the great red river division which was expected to take the field at the same time this therefore was a small party like others which had already reached the range but it contained two hundred and thirteen carts fifty-five hunters and their families making sixty lodges in all this party killed one thousand seven hundred and seventy-six cows bulls not counted many of which were killed though not even a tongue was taken which yielded two hundred and twenty-eight bags of pemmican one thousand two hundred and thirteen bales of dried meat one hundred and sixty-six sacks of tallow and five hundred and fifty-six bladders full of marrow but this was very moderate slaughter being about thirty-three buffalo to each family even as late as eighteen seventy two when buffalo were getting scarce mr grant met a half-breed family on the capel consisting of man wife and seven children 
whose six carts were laden with the meat and robes yielded by sixty buffaloes that number representing this one hunter's share of the spoils of the hunt to afford an idea of the truly military character of these red river expeditions i have only to quote a page from professor henry yule hind after the start from the settlement has been well made and all stragglers or tardy hunters have arrived a great council is held and a president elected a number of captains are nominated by the president and people jointly the captains then proceed to appoint their own policemen the number assigned to each not exceeding ten their duties are to see that the laws of the hunt are strictly carried out in eighteen forty if a man ran a buffalo without permission before the general hunt began his saddle and bridle were cut to pieces for the first offence for the second offence his clothes were cut off his back at the present day these punishments are changed to a fine of twenty shillings for the first offence no gun is permitted to be fired when in the buffalo country before the race begins a priest sometimes goes with the hunt and mass is then celebrated in the open prairies at night the carts are placed in the form of a circle with the horses and cattle inside the ring and it is the duty of the captains and their policemen to see that this is rightly done all laws are proclaimed in camp and relate to the hunt alone all camping orders are given by signal a flag being carried by the guides who are appointed by election each guide has his turn of one day and no man can pass a guide on duty without subjecting himself to a fine of five shillings no hunter can leave the camp to return home without permission and no one is permitted to stir until any animal or property of value which be lost is recovered the policemen at the order of their captains can seize any cart at nightfall and place it where they choose for the public safety but on the following morning they are compelled to bring it back to the spot from which they moved it the previous evening this power is very necessary in order that the horses may not be stampeded by night attacks of the sioux or other indian tribes at war with the half-breeds a heavy fine is imposed in case of neglect in extinguishing fires when the camp is broken up in the morning in sight of buffalo all the hunters are drawn up in line the president captains and police being a few yards in advance restraining the impatient hunters not yet not yet is the subdued whisper of the president the approach to the herd is cautiously made now the president exclaims and as the word leaves his lips the charge is made and in a few minutes the excited half-breeds are amongst the bewildered buffalo after witnessing one buffalo hunt says professor john mccoon i cannot blame the half-breed and the indian for leaving the farm and wildly making for the plains when it is reported that buffalo have crossed the border the great fall hunt was a regular event with about all the indian tribes living within striking distance of the buffalo in the course of which great numbers of buffalo were killed great quantities of meat dried and made into pemmican and all the skins taken were tanned in various ways to suit the many purposes they were called upon to serve mr francis la flesche informs me that during the presence of the buffalo in western nebraska and until they were driven south by the sioux the fall hunt of the omahas was sometimes participated in by three hundred lodges or about three thousand people all told six hundred of whom were warriors and each of whom generally killed about ten buffaloes the laws of the hunt were very strict and inexorable in order that all participants should have an equal chance it was decreed that any hunter caught still hunting should be soundly flogged on one occasion an indian was discovered in the act but not caught during the chase which was made to capture him many arrows were fired at him by the police but being better mounted than his pursuers he escaped and kept clear of the camp during the remainder of the hunt on another occasion an omaha guilty of the same offence was chased 
and in his effort to escape his horse fell with him in a coulee and broke one of his legs in spite of the sad plight of the omaha his pursuers came up and flogged him just as if nothing had happened after the invention of the colt's revolver and breech-loading rifles generally the chase on horseback speedily became more fatal to the bison than it had ever been before with such weapons it was possible to gallop into the midst of a flying herd and during the course of a run of two or three miles discharge from twelve to forty shots at a range of only a few yards or even a few feet in this kind of hunting the heavy navy revolver was a favorite weapon because it could be held in one hand and fired with far greater precision than could a rifle held in both hands except in the hands of an expert the use of the rifle was limited and often attended with risk to the hunter but the revolver was good for all directions it could very often be used with deadly effect where a rifle could not have been used at all and moreover it left the bridle hand free many cavalrymen and hunters were able to use a revolver with either hand or one in each hand general lew wallace preferred the smith and wesson in eighteen sixty seven which he declared to be the best of revolvers then it was his marvelous skill in shooting buffaloes with a rifle from the back of a galloping horse that earned for the hon w f cody the sobriquet by which he is now familiarly known to the world buffalo bill to the average hunter on horseback the galloping of the horse makes it easy for him to aim at the heart of a buffalo and shoot clear over its back no other shooting is so difficult or requires such consummate dexterity as shooting with any kind of a gun especially a rifle from the back of a running horse let him who doubts this statement try it for himself and he will doubt no more it was in the chase of the buffalo on horseback armed with a rifle that buffalo bill acquired the marvelous dexterity with the rifle which he has since exhibited in the presence of the people of two continents i regret that circumstances have prevented my obtaining the exact figures of the great kill of buffaloes that mr cody once made at a single run in which he broke all previous records in that line and fairly earned his title in eighteen sixty seven he entered into a contract with the kansas pacific railway then in the course of construction through western kansas at a monthly salary of five hundred dollars to deliver all the buffalo meat that would be required by the army of laborers engaged in building the road in eighteen months he killed four thousand two hundred and eighty buffaloes end of section seventeen